I spent years as a practicing physician and an academic studying, paper, studying healthcare finance and healthcare systems, writing papers about the topic, and sometimes going to conferences like this to speak as an expert. Uh, I now know I wasn't nearly as much of an expert as I thought. And it wasn't until starting Collective Health about four years ago that I figured something out. The real experts on the American healthcare system and the agents that are actually empowered to change it are employers who are sponsoring their own health plans. And I think for many of you in the audience, this is old news, but that's why I'm going to keep my remarks here brief today and soon hand the, hand the conversation over to two innovative employers that can share with us their strategies and that have been my teachers um, in this journey in many ways. And so when we ask who are the agents of change in the US healthcare system, it really is employers. And you heard, heard Dr. Pearl talk about this for a moment. But employers, as you know, are controlling the majority of spend in the private healthcare system. Employers as a collective, self-insured employers as a collective, are the second largest payers in our healthcare system overall behind the federal government. But these employers have an incredibly hard task. And if you think about it, what is your task as a self-insured employer? What is it that you're doing? You're effectively running your own mini health insurance company. And running your own mini health insurance company is hard. In fact, it's really hard. When you step back and you think about all of the things that you have to do, I break these into two buckets, your commitments to your company and your commitments to your people. So what exactly are you doing as a self-insured employer who's running your own mini insurance company? Your commitments to your company. You're charged with managing costs. You're charged with maintaining administrative efficiency, how you use your time, how you use the time of your team. You're also making a commitment to your company that you're going to be accountable to your data, that you're going to make decisions and inform your strategy based on what the data is telling you. And what about the commitments to your people, to your members? You're committing to them that you're going to take care of them, that you're going to maximize your population health, that you're going to make them their best possible person in the workplace by maximizing their productivity. You're going to give them the experience that they deserve. You're, you're optimizing their member experience. You're putting in place programs, and you want to make sure those programs have maximal impact for your people and their families. But that's not always the easiest thing to do. And in fact, many employers don't even recognize that that's what they're doing. We did a survey earlier this year with the Harvard Business Review. And in that survey, we asked 150 leaders at companies about their benefits strategy. And there are some remarkably surprising findings. We saw that only 17%, yes, 17% of, of C-level leaders at, at, at companies actually thought their benefits were being run effectively and efficiently. And only half of business leaders considered benefits to be of strategic importance. Only half. What's that mean the other half thought? It means largely they thought of it as a cost center, a cost that you had to sign a check every year and you had little control and little insight into what was going on. In fact, they weren't necessarily wrong. Because for many of these employers, all they could really measure was the cost of their plan. Were we as employers measuring the value, the impact, the efficacy of our programs and interventions? Do we even have the metrics to do that? Do we have the systems and the tools to measure those things? But there is a silver lining. And frankly, for me, after we started Collective Health, and you know, I still maintain my, my clinical practice here at Stanford on the faculty, and I still stay up in the world of health policy, I will tell you I have learned a lot more about the way our healthcare system works by partnering with some innovative employers. And even more importantly, I have learned a lot more about the opportunity for change by partnering with these innovative employers. Because in many ways, I see this as taking a lesson um, and looking at them is, in some ways, positive deviance. That's a, a concept that came out of uh, the world of, of, um, of social science, where you study communities 
that are subject to similar conditions. And then you ask, why is it that some of them excel and some of them don't? When you study a community where you're looking at malnutrition, you ask the question of, why is it that some families are undernourished and others are not, where they're in the same conditions? In many ways, what we're doing is we're beginning to ask, what is it that drives some employers to be those positive deviants, to be those strategic leaders, the ones that their business partners come to them and say, you're important to our company's strategy, you are more than a cost center, and you are the engine of change in the healthcare system. And what are these positive deviants do differently? I think that it's a few things. They're asking different questions, they're measuring different outcomes, and they're bringing different partners to the table. And so without further ado, allow me to introduce two str truly strategic leaders in this space, uh, Milt Ezard and John Casey. And uh, Milt is the Senior Director of Global Benefits at Activision Blizzard. Uh, before that, he actually held numerous benefits leadership roles in a wide range of industries, from healthcare to utility to software. And uh, he, I think, prides himself and, and is really seen in the benefits community as someone who's actively been challenging the status quo in benefits. And uh, at Collective Health, we're, we're fortunate that he was one of our very first partners in this journey to empower employers uh, to be better change agents in the healthcare system. I'm also very fortunate to be joined by uh, John Casey. Uh, John is the, runs global benefits, runs all of benefits at Google, um, where he's responsible for wide-ranging health and wellness programs across 40 countries. Um, before joining Google in 2010, he was at Mercer uh, for several years as a partner, um, leading their international benefits practice. And uh, John is also a, a uh, credentialed actuary. And so with that, I'm going to uh, have a seat with my panelists, and we're going to have a conversation about what they do differently, how they think, how they measure <laughs> differently to truly drive an innovative benefits program. Um, and so, John, I'll, I'll start with you. Uh, would, would love to hear from you and, and, and in, in terms of how you think about benefits, what are the questions that you're asking to inform your benefit strategy? Um, well, good morning, everyone, first of all. Um, I think I have a lot more questions than I have answers, so let's start with that, <laughs> just a level set. Um, but when it comes to our business, our benefit strategy, I guess the first question would be, like, how do we actually really deliver on business objectives. So at a high level, you know, some of these are obvious, like drive productivity. What, what does the benefit strategy say about your culture? Um, and certainly from a, an attraction and retention aspect, so that's pretty straightforward. Um, but the questions then that I ask are, are we as a, as a team, is our strategy focused on the right things? Uh, do we have the right objectives and do we have the right key results uh, measured? And some of those questions when it comes to objectives, okay, do we have the right objectives? Um, one would be simply like, for example, um, are we ensuring um, that our employees and their families are really healthy, right? And it seems like a, such a simple thing to say, but when you really sit down and think about all the complexities, all the challenges, the definitions, the metrics, the experience, everything that goes into that, it's a really tough question, but we start with that. And by doing that, by focusing on our users and focusing on getting them being healthier around their families, it links back into that business objective. Um, the next thing we would look at, I, I guess, it's no surprise, is cost. Um, how, how do we really know that we're getting the right return on our investments, the right outcomes, and so on? Um, and we have just a rigorous set of um, uh, approaches on how we manage that. Um, another question I would ask definitely is, how do we ensure our benefit strategy is creating an inclusive environment mm -hmm. so it really supports anyone with, with a need um, and there's a lot goes into that as well so I mean a lot more questions I can share but just for me hand it back yeah that, that's really interesting and, and Milt I think you know you're I imagine you're asking a lot of those same questions right um, but I, I know that you've also been pushing to really drive a highly innovative benefits program and I'm, I'm more interested in hearing from you what are the success metrics that you look at for measuring the impact of those programs and then communicating the success of those programs to your to your leadership. Right. So, you know, part of before measuring and before implementing, you know, we 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 have to seek approval to invest in in various programs um, and we do that with with based on data that we have through a, a Truven data warehouse. We know what, what what's driving our costs. So we have uh, a specific um, problem we're trying to solve 
And we know that in the conventional environment, um, metrics on solving those problems with conventional programs that conventional carriers bring um, aren't satisfactory, mm -hmm. right? So we, we implement a, a variety of tools that, that target um, particular conditions or outcomes that we're after. And we map the utilization of those tools through our data warehouse so that over time we can differentiate the participants who, who use the tools to those who don't. And we're able to measure uh, changes in illness burden mm -hmm. um, relative to the population that, that doesn't use them. So that's, that's one way. And the other way is to be able to measure engagement uh, with various tools. For example, um, if we know that a certain percentage of our diabetics don't check their blood sugar or their A1C at least once a year, that shows up in data. Um, after we implement a program, we can measure the impact of them managing their condition by hopefully an improvement in the rate of, of checking A1C. And then, you know, more softly, um, costs are always um, interesting to track. You know, we always want to make, not feel like we're such a, a cost center, you know, if you will. Um, so we want to impact costs over time. And um, we also want to measure employee satisfaction through um, the requirement that all of our vendor partners have to measure things such as NPS and engagement and um, ultimately the impact on claims yeah. that they have. That makes sense. So it sounds like in addition to cost, you're measuring quite a bit more about the impact of specific programs that you've put in place, the experience that your members are having through the journey. Mm -hmm. And I think when we, when we chat, and, and I think as you, as you well know, and we hear about this from benefits leaders, I think that's actually one of the challenges is what are those metrics other than, than cost? And so, John, I'd love to hear from your perspective, what are those metrics other than cost that, that you're tracking to measure the success of your strategy? Yeah, I mean, similar to Milt, um, I mean, it's very, very important that before you even get into metrics, um, are you really clear on what the key result is that you're after? And is that really going to deliver the right impact? So then it's a question of, okay, what are the metrics around to basically say, have you achieved that or not? So whether it's data, and we love data like uh, most companies here, um, there's a tremendous amount of metrics you can track. But again, they have to have a purpose to, are they going to help you inform your strategy to get to that key result? So there's just the purpose of metrics itself. But as an example, like take um, well-being. Um, an example of a metric that we would uh, track, and there's a bunch of them, is like what percentage of employees don't get enough sleep, so less than seven hours. Then of that cohort, what percentage lose out on over an hour of productivity a day um, because of poor sleep? So I just, when you bring it down to just a very granular level, that's what we try to do across all our programs. Um, but we certainly follow the, uh, uh, the AAA framework around effectiveness, um, efficiency, and user experience. Uh, maybe I can spend just a little bit of time just on the exper user experience on some of the metrics. Um, we, we track all communications, but more than that, what we try to do is um, do a lot of A-B testing. So what we want to try to do is, OK, what is the most effective way to get someone to take action? What should they know? How do you want them to feel? Right, so a lot goes into communication, and we just try different things. And we're learning all the time, and, um, but very granular. But there has to be a purpose to it. It's just, there's no point in just having metrics for the sake of metrics. Mm -hmm. What is it you're trying to achieve and measure? Um, and maybe just one last example to share. Um, say in the core healthcare plan, like a very specific metric we would track would be um, how many um, visits, unnecessary visits to the ER have, have there been? So you obviously have a cost element to that, but you also have an experience element to it, and arguably an effectiveness as well. So all of these kind of combine, but when you start breaking it down like that, you can actually get really good insights as well, and that can kind of refine your strategy. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's, that's interesting. And so, so for both of you, I mean, I think you're tracking a wide-ranging set of metrics that go well beyond costs. Um, but I think something that a lot of employers in the audience have actually come to us and asked in the past was, well, what is the best way for collecting this data and presenting it cohesively? And what sort of instrumentation have you created in your health plan so that you can actually do that? I mean, I think just maybe stepping back, you know, if you, if you were to think about the magnitude of spend that goes into a benefits program, um, and roughly if you're a 10,000-person employer, that's you know, $150 million a year, you, any, any spend of that magnitude as an employer, you'd probably have 
systems and automation to track and optimize. Um, how exactly are you are you working through this? Is it through emails and files, or is it is it something more systematic that you've managed to to partner or create? Are you looking at me every day? Sure. <laughs> <laughs> I wish we were that sophisticated. Um, what we do is we rely on our, our consulting partners at Mercer. So I've, I've developed a relationship with them over years and have managed to keep the same team in place. Um, we, we rely on the consulting partners to some degree to give us uh, metrics that show impact to the actuarial factors that, that are hitting our plan. Um, and we review those quarterly with senior leadership so that we can confirm and reconfirm that our, our choices and decisions have been appropriate. Um, we rely on uh, collective health for a certain degree of, of metrics, such as ER visits per thousand, if you will, and that can be tracked real time, which is pretty interesting. Is a, you know, a dashboard of, hey, I can flash up and see that number ticking as I look at it. Um, and of course, you know, the data warehouse that um, you, you invest in, that accumulates data from all sources um, and does that in a way that's you know, HIPAA compliant um, to be able to see what, what engagement impacts there have been. Mm. I, mean, uh, um, I mean, I agree with all that and we're very similar. Um, the, the, one item I would add is just going back to kind of the user. So certainly for a culture like Google and many companies, um, it's one of transparency and giving people voice. Um, so as a result, our users, our employees and their families, particularly employees, share their voice back to us. Um, and that feedback uh, sometimes is very constructive, sometimes it's complimentary. Um, but that feedback is just so valuable to us because it kind of gives us a real pulse of what's going on. And uh, the data, as Mo described, is really important, but that kind of like, okay, is, is, what, like, what is the experience? Are we actually offering things that are just being offered because that's market practice? Or have we paused and said, okay, let's not be constrained by market practice and actually really think about, is this something that's really going to add value to somebody? And in certain cases around the world, certainly, when you look at market practice, it doesn't actually deliver a meaningful need. Um, it's just people do it, so you should do it. Um, and I think if you can kind of like just take off those um, constraints and look at the problems pure, from a pure perspective, and bring in actually employee voice more, you actually get to different solutions than market practice, which is pretty mm. interesting. And um, so that voice, uh, I would just mm. add to all the analytics and data absolutely mm -hmm. is critical, yeah. Sure. Yeah, well, that, I mean, that's really interesting, John. So talking about how you actually differ from market practice and, and getting to different answers, I mean, it, it seems like both of you have actually broken away from status quo um, in, in meaningful ways at, at your respective employers. and. And I think for a lot of people in the audience that maybe haven't succeeded in breaking away from status quo yet, and from the HBR survey we, we did, we know that it's roughly half um, of employers that really do have a very status quo plan and half that are beginning to do more creative um, and innovative things. You know, what, what would be some advice that you might offer in terms of you know, how they can nudge their organization forward in that direction? Well, um Status quo is pretty comfortable, right? Um, many of us are, are, you're either a sheep or a fox. Uh, a friend told me a benefit leader is a sheep. You know, they're happy to, you know, graze all year and then once a year get a fleecing with uh, trend and, <laughs> and, and their conversation with their CFO. Um, <clears throat> foxes are a little bit different. They're uncomfortable being caged in. Um, they're willing to take some risk. Um, and I think... You know, that's the proposition you, you, you're faced with as a benefit leader. You know, um, the sheep component is safe. We're conditioned to the fact that our medical system isn't optimal. And we're conditioned to the fact that it's going to cost more every year, right? And our population is going to become diabetic because they had carbs for breakfast, you know? <laughs> um, <laughs> no finger pointing. <laughs> oh, no, no. Um, I'm crashing right now. That's why I'm kind of off the rails for Jay. <laughs> Um, but it's, it's given that that's that complacent, um, kind of conventional thinking is in place. It's not a stretch to point a finger in a direction that is at our fingertips. Now, you know, in the last few years, technology has made a huge difference in the ability for us to measure, um, not only what's happening with our population, but to measure 
what, what, what potential there is, um, and technology has given us levers to pull um, for solutions to try that are very cost effective, um, are clearly um, solutions better than condition management solutions, which are mm -hmm. typically packaged with conventional carriers. Um, and the risk is relatively low, right? Uh, what, what's the worst that can happen? If, if you put in a, a, a pregnancy program which is tracking through technology versus the pregnancy program which is offered through a carrier which has no proof of engagement or efficacy in its outcome or impact on outcomes, um, and the cost of the technology solution is small and the richness of the metrics that you can get back um, are great, um, then it's an easy, easy investment to propose. I mean, to add to that, like to the question of like uh, just uh, on uh, how you almost convince people internally mm -hmm. on how to do something different. Um, what it comes back to us is just do you have first of all the data, which is pretty obvious, right? Okay, what data do you have to actually prove this out? Um, but the other part of it is just really just like what what is your story? Like you know, putting passion into it and you really you know if you, think, if you step back for a second, like. <coughs> Um, what we're doing here is we're, we're impacting people's lives, all right? We're making, we're influencing their decision making, we're definitely influ influencing their behavior and ultimately their health of themselves and their closest people in their lives, their families, mm -hmm. right? When you think about it from that perspective, um, who doesn't want to help, right? So the, there's these constraints on budget and resources, absolutely, right? But you can navigate that and um, one way that we try to do is we'll start off and do kind of pilots. So you kind of almost confine the financial exposure. Um, so you start off with a small pilot and run experiments. You're collecting data. You're validating your hypothesis and so on. And if it, if it doesn't work, it doesn't work. Um, if it works or you need to fine tune it, at least you got that story, that case study internally. Um, and when you show that and show the impact of it, um, financially, non-financially, tangible, non-tangible, all, all of those, mm -hmm. it's really compelling. Um, but you have to be willing to kind of work, work on that. It's not easy. Um, yeah. If it was, we'd all be doing it. Yeah, it, it, it is hard. Um, so that's just one, one way of maybe mm -hmm. getting, getting the story. Yeah. And I mean, you talked about impacting people's lives, but I also think in addition, and, and part of the reason why we've all gathered here is we also know that employers are the ones that are gonna have probably the biggest impact on the US healthcare system. And I, I actually have a question that, that might be a little provocative, but you know, what's, what do you see your role as outside of just impacting the lives of your members, but actually impacting our broader healthcare system for everyone's benefit. Do you have a role to play there? Well, let me say officially, I'm not running for office, so I don't know if I can impact public <laughs> policy. Melter, are you? Uh, not impacting public policy, but, <laughs> but hoping to be a, a small example yeah. of, of um, more bold thinking and uh, movement in a direction that, mm -hmm. that gets us out of the, the, the conventional way of thinking, if you will. Yeah, but, but I think we all have, we all have a contribution here, definitely. Like it takes more than one company, two companies, three companies. And I think hopefully there's, there's um, um, a, gr a group of employers that are challenging the status quo and you know, that voice and even just like, you know, if we can develop a new way of thinking, maybe in even a small area, for us to execute against that largely, we have to work with partners. And hopefully, you know, as we work with our partners and so on, they're also getting better and so on, and they share that across their portfolio of clients as needed. So it kind of like naturally evolves that way. But you know, I guess we have so many challenges right now internally that it's hard for us to do both. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I, I look at so many of the employer customers that we work with, and 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 what they tell us, and and you know, you you've both shared some of this, is actually you know what we're what we're doing to improve our plan you know, it can have externalities for the broader system. We can, A, set an example for other employers, but, you know, if we encourage a provider system to do things differently, can that have a positive impact on the system? You know, where, where you sit as the largest payers in the U.S. healthcare system, um, I think it's, it's often been hard to leverage that impact because there are, frankly, 60,000 different decision makers among the various self-insured employer mm -hmm. plans, but kind of actually getting together with common agendas or common common frameworks for how you approach things. You know, I do think there is an opportunity for a collective movement, uh, excuse the pun, um, to, to actually begin to move things forward as a, as a set of employers. Um, and really, I think even, even if what we're moving forward is actually just the metrics 
that matter um, beyond costs, right? If you bring in the value metrics and the, the experience metrics into that and the impact metrics of your programs, I think that that framework for even questioning and, and, and measuring success is one that can move the entire system forward. Um, so I actually want to maybe take a slightly personal turn and, and note and, and ask kind of each of you, you know, what is it that, that drove you to this field? How did you gravitate to benefits um, and, and managing these plans? And frankly, why is it that you're motivated to be an innovator on a personal level um, in, in benefits? Yikes. <laughs> <laughs> um, I think it, 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 for me, it comes with a really long career of, of, of managing conventional stuff. I'm, I'm, I'm a very um, restless guy, right? So, um, and I think I'd had enough of conventional ways of dealing with the healthcare system. Um, and I, I, it comes with age, right? You, you hit your 50s and you're like, F that. I can, I can risk it. Um, and it's kind of true because I have a, a fairly short, short, you know, horizon till I retire. Um, I so you were going to go somewhere else. Good. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, so with that, and um, working for an organization that, that has been really used to a conventional way of thinking, but lately wants to become more innovative and, and cutting edge, um, it's given me the drive, if you will, to, to take you know, educated risks um, to really perhaps make an impact. And, and it's about impacting people's lives, right? You look around you and, um, you know, living, you know, 50 some odd years, you see the state of our population's health. And instead of it, you know, improving, right, as it should be, because we're smarter all the time, you know, technology's improving all the time. Instead, you see this degradation of, of, of well-being and, and of health. Mm -hmm. You see costs, you know, going like that, and you see the future costs, unless you intervene, going even higher, right, and being unsustainable. Um, I mean, the opportunity is just so great, and the challenge is, is, is there to, to, to begin to hopefully affect some kind of change. Yeah. Absolutely. <coughs> Sorry. Um, I ask a question. Um, I guess, uh, let me be really honest here. Um, so I'm an actually by background, so there's definitely a nerd aspect to me. So when it comes to like data and problems and just being intellectually curious, um, there's very few domains, and certainly in the world of benefits, U.S. healthcare has to be on the top of the list of just from a purely intellectual perspective. How do you, like, how do you actually navigate all this? Um, and and we, we spoke about the different outcomes um, and so on that you're trying to get to. So I'd say just personally, I'm kind of, that's how I'm wired with data and just problem solving and so on. Um, the second part, I, I mean, going back to as we touched on, is just like the massive influence and which comes to responsibility you have for so many people. It's staggering when you, see, when you pause and, and think about it. And that comes, it comes with almost a duty of care. So how do you live up to that standard? I, I take very personally. And then I think the last area for me would be, um, I guess, just trying new things. I mean, it's, it's fun. It's been being creative. And, and um, mm -hmm. certainly the culture of Google like, kind of expects that and enables that. And I feel very fortunate to have that support. Um, and good things can happen, right? Sometimes it's not always easy, right? But um, so I think it's a combination mm -hmm. of this intellectual curiosity, doing the right thing to help people, and ha having that ability to do it in a culture where I work, I feel very fortunate, yeah. Mm. Yeah, no, that's, I, I, I think, I imagine everybody in the audience has a similar story about why they do what they do. Um, but I think the culture of your, your organization is one that clearly welcomed your approach. Um, and I would, I, would, I would think that hopefully the culture of many organizations is beginning to, to change in the way that we think about our responsibility in, in providing benefits to our people and, and our duty to care. I mean, as a practicing physician, I know that, you know, I have impact on one person at a time, but when you're running these plans and creating these programs, you have the opportunity to impact, you know, tens of thousands of people at a time and, and actually do so quite profoundly um, because the, the gap between, you know, excellent clinical care and the frustration that you often get on the other side with 
the way a health plan is run or what's covered and what isn't covered or the communications that you get from it um, can be staggering. And it almost feels like we have a very modern healthcare delivery system and a, a, a world of typewriters and fax machines when it comes to communicating benefits and administrating <laughs> those plans. And so it, it's, it's, it's amazing to see how we can actually begin to really improve that experience throughout and in doing so actually amplify what our healthcare delivery system can be, can be doing. Um, I'd love to hear from, from both of you, actually, just before we close, um, you know, what, what, what problems do you think are still unsolved? Um, and I, I think there are many, but, but if you were to suggest kind of something that you want to focus on and something that you want to pursue at either your own, your own company or more broadly, um, you know, in the, in the field, what, what do you think is still untouched and unsolved or perhaps touched but unsolved? Well, you know, I think we're not, uncommon from from most organizations in that you know in 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 the in the, the budget that we have and the spend that we have annually for healthcare, you know it's really about one to two percent of that population that's that's driving 60 percent of that spend right those catastrophic cases that um you know are either being managed incorrectly or they are uh being overmanaged, if you will, by the, the medical system to sustain life in a way that is not rich and mm -hmm. worth living, if you will, um, but yet extremely expensive and extremely difficult um, on, on the family and, and on the member and on the, the employee team that, that that member is is leaving behind. And I think, you know, our culture in the U.S. is is strangely you know, unrealistic with regard to life and end of life decisions that uh, we, we think you throw everything and the kitchen sink at it to get just a few more days or a few more weeks um, of low quality. And I think that's an area of opportunity for us, you know, as a culture to um, understand that life is finite, you know, telomeres get shorter um, and let's be reasonable. Absolutely. Yeah. And, it, and I, I completely agree with you. It's a, a cultural change and, mm -hmm. and something I, I care very deeply about personally, but there's some good, interesting surveys on this that show that it's quite uniquely American, mm -hmm. um, our, our feeling of trying to prolong life as much as possible and at any cost. Um, I'm so happy to, to dive into that. If we had more time, that could be a panel in and of itself. Yeah, that'd be fun. Um, <laughs> um, yeah, I guess for me, um, there's lots of areas, but I, I, the one that comes to the top of mind is, um, I think it might have been mentioned earlier on in the earlier speaker, was um, how do we just get the users, right, our, you know, our employees, our families, just to experience healthcare and empower them and, and, and have like a way different experience. and. There's so many stories. We all have our own personal experiences of, you know, why is it the healthcare system experiences one way that if that was anywhere else, like it would be bankrupt, right? It would just like you wouldn't tolerate it um, as a user. So I think we need to like what I would, you know, aspirationally and I would love is um, for consumers to really ha have have more of a say in, mm -hmm. and and have more inside influence to their outcomes and uh, just get on with life and not be caught up in all this bureaucracy, administration, misunderstanding, having no clue, going down the least path, a path of re least resistance to the worst outcome. There's so many challenges there and I mean, where do we start? Talk about like, there's so many questions there. Um, but imagine if the experience was different. Imagine if it was like checking into a five-star hotel or on a Disney cruise, I went on a Disney cruise with my kids. Magical, <laughs> right? Magical. How different would the world be? Um, it'd be absolutely amazing. Um, and hopefully all of us together can, you know, play our role and play our part and challenge it. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. And, and I would add that that's exactly, to me, you know, why I left the world of academic research um, and, and clinical medicine to, to focus on what we do at Collective Health. It really is to, to create that future and what it, what it could look like. Um, but I actually think, you know, first, thank you both for, for sharing your thoughts. I think the, the transformation begins by exchanging ideas with different employers about the strategies they've taken and what they find to be effective. And the next step, I think, is actually 
having employers actually work more collaboratively across these metrics, across sharing these outcomes and, and sharing these strategies. Um, but I think what you've shared today is an inspiration um, for me and I imagine for many of you in the audience. So thank you and a round of applause for, for John and for Milk.